Clarity on Fire, a podcast for people who know what they don't want out of their life and career, but aren't sure what they'd rather be doing. In a world where it's easy to exist, but hard to feel alive, we, Kristen and Rachel, two certified life and career coaches, are here to help you cut through the information overload, get unstuck, and focus not just on how you can have a career you're passionate about, but how to create a whole life that feels fulfilling. So join us here, where we serve up inspiration and down-to-earth wisdom in a way that only two best friends can. We want you to experience the relief of knowing that, yes, you're allowed to want more out of your life and career. And no, you don't have to wander through the dark anymore. Our job is to light the fire that shows you the way. Let's go. I did this last year on the day of, but it's the day before, but I still have to say, may the fourth be with you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> this is not quite the right day, but And happy okay. Cinco de Mayo, too, All right. this weekend. You can just get turnt drinking margaritas in your Darth Vader mask if you want to. <laughs> Rewatching old Star Wars movies. <laughs> or the new ones. Or the new ones. You know how I love my Adam Driver. Oh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um. Okay. So, hello, this is a new Dear Rachel. If you're new to Clarity on Fire and you're like, what is this? Is that an STD? It's not. Crachel? <laughs> it is a portmanteau of our names. It's, it's, not our... Even, it's not very attractive. I didn't give it to us. This, it is what it is, but this is our advice. No, column. this name was thrust upon us and we just decided to accept it. Like your use of the word thrust after my use of the phrase <laughs> STD. Okay. <laughs> so it's going off the rails already and we're barely started. I don't think they ever expect it to be fully on. No. Okay. So this is our podcast advice column where you guys listen and you write in. And thank you to everyone who submitted questions. There were a couple I really wanted to get to, but they came a little bit too late. So I'm going to try to get to them next month. Plus, we have a little bit of a theme going on here. And we wanted to stick with that. But we will hopefully get to your questions maybe next month. Yeah. So before we answer the three questions we chose for this month. I want to remind you that if you ever want to submit a question, there's always a link to the form where we take questions in the episode description of every episode of our podcast. So it would be impossible for you not to find if you ever have a question or a dilemma or a crisis or just need some outside perspective. That's where you can go. And we'll always consider it. Okay. But before we do that... I want to read a new review because obviously that's one of our favorite things to do is (laughs) read the nice things people say about us. Out loud. Yeah. So this one's from someone with the initials LZ, getting deep. Well, she said getting. She didn't say getting, but (laughs) I I artistically (laughs) interpret it that way. (laughs) She says, this is such a great podcast that rises above the superficial quick fixes to your life, which there are no truly quick fixes, by the way. I agree. Rachel and Kristen delve into wide-ranging topics around career and personal growth. I truly appreciate the theme that runs through their episodes. In order to get clarity, you have to do the inner work first. Mm. Yes. Truth. This podcast always gives me a reason to reflect and provides fresh perspectives I hadn't thought about. Keep it up, ladies. Oh. Thank you, LZ. What a good review. I feel like she. I'm assuming it's a she, but it could we don't be me. No. It could be man. I feel like this person captured could be, us. Could be Lawrence Zebra Tin. <laughs> That's not a name. (laughs) You don't know. (laughs) I think that person captured us very well. Okay. Uh, So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. And of course, ratings and reviews are never frowned upon as long as they're good. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, they bring us joy. Yeah. So if you're new and you haven't rated and reviewed, you can just slide into that. (laughs) You can just slide into our ratings and reviews. (laughs) Is that a phrase? I think we should coin that. (laughs) Okay. All right. Are you ready? All right. See if you guys can pick out the theme of this month. It won't be hard. No, it's not. It's pretty obvious. Okay. Okay. Let's get into question number one. Hi, Rachel. I like how people just use that colloquial. And that's just well, a, we invited it. I know. And I know. they're doing it. I think it's great. I'll start off, of course, with a big thank you for all the advice you give. It makes my morning bus ride home a bit more or makes it a bit more fun and helps me walk into the office not feeling so overwhelmed by big abstract worries. Well, you're welcome, Hannah. My question, 
I have a coworker who is great at what she does, a very fun and interesting person. But at the same time, her first words in the office most days are expletives and woe is me complaints. I'm not sure if it bothers others in the office, but it really drains me. I don't want to be unsympathetic, but after a certain number of complaints, it starts to drag me down. Do you have any tips for staying above that? Or do you think maybe it's just a negative work environment and I should plan my escape ASAP, which I've been considering for quite some time already? Thanks again, Hannah. Okay, a lot of thoughts on this. One, no, you should not necessarily quit your job just because you have one annoying coworker. Now, separately, you might have every good reason to quit your job, and we can talk about that later. But if we're driven out of everything by the one person who's kind of annoying or draining, we will never stay anywhere long because the world abounds with annoying, draining people who, like you said, might be fun sometimes, but their energy just pulls the whole room down. There is always that person in every working environment. I I hate to say it. You can have the best team ever, but someone is going to be the Debbie Downer. Okay, so first thing that comes to mind is this. You have the responsibility, you have more power and responsibility than you think you have to set the tone of how this goes. Right now, it's kind of like you're being victimized. And I don't mean to say that in a negative way. I just mean like you are at the effect of her morning expletives. Don't you love that? <laughs> like morning F-bombs and like... First thing in the morning. <laughs> like, I'm not going to... I mean, I, I can kind of picture it in my head and I, I'm oh, kind of yeah. entertained by it. But I also know it must suck for you, Hannah. I'm sorry about that. But <laughs> anyway, you have more power and control over this than you think you do. So... You get to set the boundary and the tone for how you communicate with people. And you really, really can train people how to react or respond or communicate with you. So you have the power to, if she engages you in complaints and expletives, you are allowed to change the subject, give her really short like one word, two word responses that make it very clear that you are not at all interested in engaging Or just like kind of walk away. Honestly, you were allowed to just be like, okay, and then walk away. And I find it interesting that you also say that she's fun and interesting at times, which tells me that sometimes she actually is fine to communicate with and she's not terrible all the time, which means this is the good thing. When she's engaging you in a way that's actually pleasant or interesting, that's when you can also teach her how to how to respond to you because if you're pleasantly engaged and communicative right back with her when she's being totally pleasant to be around and then when she's being a complete b you just have nothing to do with her and shut her down and walk away guess what message she's going to receive about the way she's communicating with you right that this is training people it really is training people how to communicate with you so she's going to understand oh she's not super open to my complaints yeah and that wouldn't be the worst message for her to receive from you. You could also go at this a very different way. This is, could be, use your intuition on this one because certain people might take advantage of this and other people might really respond well. But you could actually just ask her, hey, it sounds like you're kind of frustrated and not super happy here. What's going on? Or have you been looking into other opportunities? And invite her to talk about her complaints in a way that's a little bit more constructive and getting to the point instead of just negativity for negativity's sake. Yes. So this is something I find a lot easier to do with people you're really close with and people you're like friends and family with. It might be a little harder with a coworker, but hopefully the point will maybe either plant a seed or give you some ideas about how you can approach her. But typically with someone you're close with, what I say in this circumstance is you can actually say... I am happy to help you talk about solutions. I'm happy to acknowledge your feelings. I understand where you're coming from. And if all you're going to do on the phone right now or over dinner right now is bitch and moan and complain, I am not going to engage with you. I'm just not going to have this conversation. And again, might not be something you can actually say to a coworker, but I do think that you can send that message just in the way that you communicate in general with someone without explicitly saying, I don't tolerate like moaning for the sake of moaning. 
Right. You can steer the conversation toward solutions and they may or may not be open to that. Right. And that's not your responsibility to make them open to it. But if you open up that possibility, it might get them thinking, oh, maybe I should do something about this instead of just talking about it ad nauseum. Yeah. And that could be a productive way of steering the conversation sometimes. Now, one big caveat with this, I'm not going to talk much about it because we're going to do a whole podcast about this later this month. But there are some people who are called energy vampires. Yes. And they just suck all of the positivity out of you. They're completely draining people. And this approach would not work on an energy vampire. Actually, it would backfire because they feed on people trying to fix them. They feed on that energy and attention you give by trying to fix them. So we're not trying to fix this girl. We're just trying to send the message that... I'm not here for complaining for the sake of complaining. If you want to if you want to engage in productive conversation, I'm all for that. That's fine. Yeah. And definitely listen later this month because we will be getting into how to tell if someone is an energy vampire and how to respond to that. So that might be going on here or it might just be a girl who's kind of unhappy and complains yeah. a lot. So if yeah. that's the case, then talking about solutions might be helpful to her. If she's an energy vampire, don't even go there. That's just going to steal your own energy even yeah. more. I mean, I'm all, again, people are going to be like, whoa, big surprise. Rachel is all for calling people out. But, <laughs> you know, I'm all for calling people out. And I feel like what this girl needs to hear, and I'm not saying you're the one who needs to say it, but again, this might plant some seeds with you for how to engage with her. I feel like what she needs to hear is, hey, I get that you're frustrated. It, it sounds like you're not happy because you literally complain all the time. And you're full of expletives all the time. So anyone who's doing that's got to be in some degree of pain. And are you doing anything about that? Are you being coached through that? Are you going to therapy? Are you interested in finding a new job? Because complaining makes sense. But if you're not doing anything about it, complaining is literally only going to make this worse. That's what she needs to hear. Oh, she needs to hear it. Yeah. And maybe it's up to you, Hannah. Maybe it's not. not, Certainly not your responsibility. And that's the last thing I want to share with you is actually that, as not the last thing I want to say oh, about this it's it's the last point I want to make okay. and then you can go wherever you want to go <laughs> which is that your job is not to change this girl no your job is to protect your own energy and so some of that might be disengaging and sometimes that might mean can you put headphones in and play some music and tune her out when she's in that complaining mindset Can you maybe move to a different cube that was a little Mm -hmm. bit further away from her? Could you ask to be relocated to a different working space? There are some ways where you could protect your energy or you could even tell her, hey, I have been trying to do this thing where I'm not complaining very much. Maybe you even say, I heard on a podcast that I'm... That complaining is completely dragging down everyone's energy and I decided I'm not going to do it. They challenged us to do a two-week... no complaining challenge and I want to give it a try. And so I'm just not going to engage with this because it's going to tempt me to get into complaining mode as well. Yeah. So why you don't can... you do it with me? Sounds like you could use it. <laughs> well, that may or may not, she may or may not be open to that, but you can at least disengage from yeah. the complaining by setting a hard boundary and saying, I'm not interested in engaging with you. It's not your job to fix her. It is your job to set hard boundaries, loving boundaries to protect yourself. And that's a really good lesson to learn because we are always going to have people who are going to try to steal our energy. And so we have to learn how to protect ourselves. Uh, The last thing I want to say about this is that I'm hearing the devil's advocate somewhere in the crowd saying, well, isn't it wrong to like shut this girl's feelings down? And like, isn't this like, kind of what you guys said you shouldn't do in your last side chat about not honoring feelings and how being too positive is kind of a front. So for that person who may not exist, but that I hear in my mind right now, (laughs) I want to say that this is, this is not what I think if this girl was willing to talk about her actual feelings, that would be game changing. And I wouldn't say it's Hannah's job to necessarily coach someone through, um, their emotional experience, because that's not Hannah's job. That's a therapist's job. That's a coach's job. Hannah didn't have to engage with anybody she didn't want to engage with. This isn't a family member. This isn't someone she's obligated to be friends with. So it's different because it's a coworker. But if she was willing to actually talk about like what's really going on with her underneath the complaints, that to me is what you acknowledge. You acknowledge someone's feelings. 
you acknowledge the emotional experience that they're having. But when you're just complaining, that's a completely surface level experience that I do not think you need to engage with with a person. It's not productive. It's not productive. It's not helpful. It's not useful. And so I want this girl, whoever she is, to get to the root of her pain. And I want her to be able to talk it out with someone. Hannah was probably not the right person to do that with. But if all she wants to do is complain, that's not productive. Yeah. And you do not have to engage. And you do not have to accept that. So you did ask should I consider leaving this job? Is this a toxic work environment? And that question, I feel like I can't answer with just knowing this one situation. If you like your job, except for this one girl who's kind of draining, then like we said at the beginning, you can't keep moving around just to avoid the negative people in the world. You're going to encounter them and it's about learning how to interact with them and set boundaries with them in a healthy way. If you're unhappy in your job and this person's just pushing you over the edge, okay, then that's a different conversation. If she's one of many reasons, then that's a different story. So I want to wrap up this question by just giving you some recommended listening. Maybe you've listened to some of these or all of them or none of them, but I want to, there's a couple things that come to mind that could be helpful based on your situation. The first is our expert interview from February with our friend Stacy about navigating a toxic workplace. And these, this type of dynamic is something we talk about in that episode. And just a couple other things that are relevant is our, our side chat about what to do when you want to fix people. And that one was from March. And then our side chat from this past month about, like we just mentioned, wanting to, what did I call it? Oh, why positive thinking is mostly BS. <laughs> right. <laughs> just in case you need, someone needs a little bit of a reminder about like, where where is the line between, okay, well, when am I allowed to have negative emotions? When am I allowed to complain? And when am I just sugarcoating it with positivity? That's a really good one to help you understand like when certain emotional reactions are appropriate and when they're not. Yeah, we'll link to those in the episode description. I have them written down so I won't forget. Okay. All right, Hannah, let us know how that sits with you. We'd love to hear from you. You can email us. We gave you a lot of ideas, so let us know which one you want to give a try. You can email us at contact at clarityonfire.com with an update if you want, or you can always leave a comment on this episode. The link in the um, episode description will take you there. Or if you sympathize with Hannah and you want to say, hey, I'm going through this too. This is what I'm going to try. I'm sure she would be glad to know she's not alone. So, okay, second question. I've always felt like I had to act really differently in an office environment than I do in everyday life, particularly with my bosses. I'm currently a freelancer, and I feel like one of the major reasons I loathe the thought of going back to work in an office is that I never found a sweet spot of balancing my regular personality with my work personality. Changing aspects of my personality to be more workplace appropriate or be more acceptable to a boss or coworker makes me feel dead inside. Any advice? Kate. Oh, Kate. I so have experienced this myself. I mean, haven't we all? I mean, we've all had to like sort of put on our workplace persona or our grandparent persona. Oh, yeah. We all have a grandparent persona, (laughs) don't we? I remember a few years ago, I went with my parents and my brother to church and I was just pleasantly chatting with a lot of the older members who have known me since I was really little. And my brother said later on, that day, he's like, you have a totally different voice when you talk to these people at church than you do when you're just talking to me. Yeah. So you have a customer service voice. (laughs) Exactly. It's very pleasant. Yeah. I really don't like it. It's kind of breathier too. Like, hi. (laughs) Okay. That sounds great. I'm like, who are you? (laughs) Right. So I have fallen in this trap many times. And it's particularly tough in a workplace because you're there all the time. You can have your grandparent personality, but you're probably only with them for short spans of time. Right. When you have to be in an office for 40 plus hours a week and you're not being yourself, that is incredibly draining. So I don't blame you for being like, uh, I don't think I can do this indefinitely. This is too hard. I also don't think you need to. So yeah, <laughs> I don't understand why being yourself is so inappropriate yeah. at work. I mean, I'm a little biased because I actually know Kate. Like I know I have been acquainted with Kate's personality in the past. And I'm like, 
I don't understand what's so crazy off-putting about Kate that she can't be herself (laughs) at the office. And I think that's true for a lot of us, that we have some assumptions and maybe some past experiences that are kind of feeding into our current assumptions about you have to turn your personality off or people expect you to be like buttoned up and shut down. So I think the first question I have for both Kate and anyone listening who agrees with Kate and like experiences this too and is worried about this is what is it that you think you have to not do or not be or shut down in order to be workplace appropriate, quote unquote? What are you afraid people are going to see about you that is so inappropriate for this setting? Yeah, because I think until you name the thing that you're afraid of not getting to be or express, I think it might be hard to get to the root of the problem. Or maybe when you name it, you might realize, wait, why was I worried about this again? I'm actually not as crazy and out there and weird as I think I am. I think I might have a perception of myself that's a little bit stronger or weirder than other people are going to perceive me. Or I might have an interpretation of workplaces in general that might not actually be accurate. I think that that's a big point too, is that the workplace is changing, maybe slower than we want it to change, but, and I do I do believe and I understand that there are certainly workplaces, plenty that ex- still exist, where people do expect you to just shut down your personality and be blah and beige and boring and don't bring any pizzazz or personality into the mix. But I think that that's dying. I do. I think that as millennials are aging, we're like, wait, why do you have to change who you are in order to work? That doesn't make any sense. And so people are way more accommodating now and way more open now than I think they used to be. And I think maybe if you've had experiences like a decade ago in the workplace, those might still be your touchstone for what you can expect now. And I honestly think that a lot is changing and has changed and that it might be a lot safer to be weird or quirky or colorful or vibrant or full of personality than it might have been in years past. Exactly. I wanted to ask Kate, where did this belief come from that you have to be a certain way in the workplace? Did this come from just society at large? Did this come from previous work experiences where you tried to be a little bit quirky or a little bit opinionated or whatever you think it is that's so offensive and you got it was poorly received? Yeah. Or did this come from your parents who were talking about how they had to be a certain way in a meeting? So if you look back and say, where did I get this belief? then you might realize that is irrelevant to me now. Where I worked before made me miserable and it didn't fit me at all. And I'm not interested in working in a place like that anymore. So I don't need to be that way. Or what was true for my parents doesn't have to be true for me. Or what was true in a society, like Rachel said, a decade or longer ago is not particularly relevant in this day and age. So if you can figure out where did I even get that, it might be easier for you to let it go. And I also want you to start experimenting in your current working environment. I want you to bring even just 10% more true Kate (laughs) into the work environment and maybe share a little bit more about what you're doing outside of work or be a little bit more bold or be a little bit more whatever it is that you're afraid of being. And I guarantee you, probably no one will even really notice or they might respond well, but I don't think you're going to get this terrible backlash of, oh my God, who do you think you are that you're afraid is going to happen? Yeah. So you don't have to go do a whole 180. You can start to bring a little bit more of your true personality in, in little ways and see nothing bad is happening. I feel like I have this visual in my mind of Kate and others believing that they're putting on their real personality is equivalent to like wrapping themselves in colorful Christmas tree lights And then like, you know, putting flags, little flags all over themselves and like bells and whistles. And they're just like jangling and blinking around the office. And what's really, it's just like a flashy necklace, you know, (laughs) that's like the real interpretation is actually a bright top. Oh, wow. Right. Like it's like one little flag, like it's not like eight million all over your body. So I think, I mean, I'm not trying to diminish the concern. I'm trying to hopefully put it into maybe more realistic perspective. Also, if you genuinely encounter a work environment or a job opportunity 
where you believe after having an interview, having conversations with people that you would have to shut down your personality and that it would not be accepted, you do not have to take that job. That can be a deal breaker. That should be a deal breaker. That's a huge deal breaker. And I want to encourage you to believe that that is not true of all workplaces anymore. I just had a conversation with a client yesterday who had a really great second interview. And she wasn't sure after the first interview how the workplace culture would be. But in the second conversation, she actually had a really frank conversation about how the person who was interviewing her had tattoos. And she has tattoos. And a lot of people in the office have tattoos. And they're like, that's cool. And oh, you have a nose ring. That's neat. Like, They were totally accepting of her, you know, looking kind of punk rock, not super straight-laced, buttoned up, you know, Ann Taylor chic. So if you have the courage to show up as yourself in an interview situation, I think that that can be so telling. How they react to you, how you react to them. I think that if it's really bad and it's a mismatch, don't go for that. But there's plenty of people who I think will accept you for who you are because, again, who you are is not, oh, my God, insane. (laughs) Right. And I want to make a distinction here between being a different person, almost putting on your persona before you go to work and being someone that you're not really versus being yourself, but being aware of your surroundings. So if you curse like a sailor to all your friends and family, then not cursing like a sailor at work doesn't mean you're not being yourself. Does that make sense? Like you can yeah. you can be yourself and still recognize, okay, you could be eating dinner in a nice restaurant and recognize this probably isn't the place for me to break out into song, even though I love music. It's not not being yourself. It's just being cognizant of the surroundings. But you don't need to go in and pretend to have qualities you don't have or pretend to be interested in things that you're not interested in, or be someone that you're not in order to be aware of what's going on in your surroundings. Yeah. Right? You don't have to, like, tone it down in order... I mean, like, we all have to kind of, like, play by certain rules. But if if it's a deal breaker for you, then you don't eat at that restaurant. You don't work at that job. You know, you don't hang out with the people who make you feel like you can't be yourself. It's okay to have certain things that we have to like rein in every once in a while, but you get to decide where the line is. That's a normal part of interacting with other humans on a daily basis. Yeah. And it doesn't have to mean turning off your personality. Yeah, and I want you to make that distinction. Yeah. I think she's treating it a bit like an all or nothing, maybe accidentally. Well, that it's, would be another good podcast for wow. you to listen to. Oh, wow. We have a lot. <laughs> yes, we do. Okay. Well, very, very related to what we just said is this last question, which is why I included it. This is kind of a one-two punch. You're going to see the theme now. I know you will. Okay. I've been following you two for a number of years now. I'm behind on your podcast, but one that has been in my brain lately is one of your very first ones where you discussed being yourself in interviews. I was still at a job I hated when I listened to it and vowed to follow that advice going forward. Fast forward to now. I was laid off and am trying to pivot to something different. This has obviously been difficult. I've had two interviews so far, and I feel like being myself is actually turning them off. The interviews have been for positions I would love to have, but I feel like maybe I'm too honest when answering questions, and my personality is a little polarizing. This has been my problem in previous jobs too, except in those cases, I pretend to be like everyone else in interviews, and then my personality comes out afterward, and it turns out no one can stand me. I'm really struggling to find a middle ground, I guess. And this is from Jillian. Okay, so now you get the theme. Everyone's like, how do I just be myself? Like those last two questions are both, how do I walk the middle ground between being myself and being liked? And I think it's really funny how that relates to the first question because the girl who Hannah's complaining about clearly doesn't care how people are interpreting her or doesn't realize, <laughs> no, right? Not like, at all. We get Kate and Jillian over here like, oh my God, I don't want to have to turn myself off, but I want to be accepted. And they're caring a lot how people perceive them. And this girl's just over here cursing like a sailor <laughs> first thing in the morning. So like- And she still has a job. And she still has a job, but someone can't stand being yeah, around her. True. So there's that. But that's not her real personality. You know, constant complaining is not her real personality. Whatever her real personality is, is being buried by- her pain and her dissatisfaction with whatever she's got going on in life. However, this isn't about her. This is about Jillian. (laughs) Okay. So the thing that comes to my mind, and I think this is 
a really important point, not just for Jillian, it's also important for Kate too, is I think that personality is incredibly important, but it might not actually be the most important thing for how people interpret you and what people pick up on when they meet you or when they interact with you. I think more critical than your personality is the energy that you give off. I don't care if you're a really nice person, really pleasant, or if you're kind of abrasive, kind of intense, kind of too honest, kind of direct. I relate to all of those things, obviously. I think that it's natural that sometimes if you're a polarizing personality, you'll, yeah, sure, you'll turn people off. But I think what people respond to even more than your personality is the energy with which you show up the energy through which your personality flows. So if you're calm and confident and just really relaxed with who you are and you're kind of a weirdo or and you're kind of honest and you're kind of like direct, people will pick up more on your energy than they will on what you're saying. If, however, your energy is more like sad or it's desperate, which can kind of happen sometimes in an interview, particularly if you're like, oh my God, I really just need a job. You know you can show up kind of nervous, anxious, desperate. Same with like a date. Oh my God, I'm turning 35 and I haven't had a kid and I need to get married. Please love me. Please marry me. Oh my God, (laughs) nauseating. Doesn't matter how cool your personality might really be under the surface. So if your energy is pouring out something that's sending people a negative message, it doesn't matter what your personality is. And I'm not necessarily saying that's what Jillian is doing, but I think that it's really important to consider what's my energy signature? Like what energy profile, so so to speak, am I wafting around these people? Am I sending off fear, anxiety, defensiveness, closed offness, especially if you go into like an interview setting and you're, because of your past assumptions and experiences, expecting people to dismiss you, expecting people not to like you, you'll get into porcupine mode, right? You'll get your quills all up. You'll kind of get defensive. And instead of people being able to talk to you, what they're picking up on is your your closed off, walled up, defensive energy. And then you're creating the reality of them not liking you. But it's not because of your personality that they don't like you. It's because of the energy that they're encountering because of the interpretation you're making about what they're going to think of you. You lead with your energy. Your personality yeah, is just actually said that. not... <laughs> Is is not as strong or as in your face as your energy is. And so I guarantee you know people who have weird and quirky personalities, but they are completely approachable and likable and comfortable with themselves. And those people are easy to be around, even if they're weird. I know this is not a real person, but I can't stop thinking about Luna Lovegood right now. I was thinking about her too, (laughs) obviously. I mean, obviously. I mean, she is so weird and quirky and and says really awkward things. And to be fair, not a lot of people wanted to be her friend, but her energy was approachable and warm. Yes. And she's very comfortable in who she is. She likes herself. Yeah. And so she did end up making friends with people who were like, okay, well, you're kind of weird, but we like you anyway. That's part of what is what being polarizing is, is if you're a polarizing person, people are going to have strong feelings about you one way or the other. And again, they're responding to both your energy and your personality. So even if you have a weird, quirky personality, but your energy is self-assured and trusting that this is going to work out if it's supposed to work out, then they may or may not like you, but it's not because it's because it wasn't meant to be. Right. If you're polarizing, people are going to have strong opinions, which also means that the right people are going to freaking love you. I guarantee you, Jillian, that you have some people in your life who totally love you because of who you are, not despite your personality, which is what you're afraid of. And if those people can like you, they're not the only humans on the planet who are going to like you because of who you are. Right. So even if a job looks like it's going to be a great fit for you on paper... If the people are going to not like you because of your polarizing personality, well, that's not really a place you want to be. Some people are going to embrace you for who you are. I think Rachel can probably speak to this. Be feeling you've felt like a polarizing person. I mean, for most of your life, correct? Yeah. I mean, again, if I have to add one more, our side chat about being too much or not enough, right? I've always identified with being too much. And yeah, I have gotten literally fired for being for your personality for being disliked for my personality and you know what 
whatever. I don't care. Those weren't my people. I actually wrote a blog about that. Maybe I'll link to that too. There's going to be a really long list of things that you should listen to. So go to the episode description to look for that. But yeah, but the, the reason they fired me was not because of the energy I was putting out. It was literally just because they didn't like me. And that's and okay. That's fine because not everyone is going to like you and that's okay. But give people a chance to actually judge you for the right reasons, which is who am I? What is my personality? Do we align? But I think if you can, and I've struggled with this too, if you get defensive and you kind of go in there like, I know they're not going to like me, then that changes the, like, that changes the flavor with which you're putting yourself out there. And people can pick up on it. We are animals. We can pick up on those minute changes in people's energy. So I really would like for you to just accept, I know this is easier said than done, but I would really like for for you to just accept that who I am is fine. This is who I am and there's nothing wrong with it. And I don't need to be defensive of it. I don't need to be protective of it. I don't need to try to be someone I'm not. I just need to go in there and with a calm, relaxed confidence in who I am, just talk about myself. I don't need to be defensive. I don't need to be freaked out. I don't need to be anxious that I have to please or that I don't really want to please. You just need to be relaxed in who you are and trust that people will pick up on a confident person. People take the lead from confident people. people that's all people really want. People are pack animals. They just want to be around people who feel confident and self-assured. Alpha types. And I'm not talking about like masculine, pushy, tough, you know, like Take charge, the rock looking guys. Like, I mean, we love the rock. He's actually a real feminist. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that you don't have that, that type of alpha. I'm talking about someone who just people want to follow or want to be their leader or want to listen to because they are confident in themselves. They have something to say and they're not ashamed of it, but they're not, they're not overly defensive of it. They don't need you to like them. That's who people like. People who don't need you to like them. Yes. Well, the the point you're making here is that your personality might be your personality, but you can change your energy. Sure. You have total control over that. And you can decide, I'm going to go in and just trust if this is meant to be, it's meant to be. And I'm not going to stress too much over it. And I'm just going to be myself and be honest, but also be friendly about it. I don't need to be cocky or... Right. Being overly honest sometimes can be like, I'll show, I'm going to be myself to the extreme and they're going to I'm going to punch you in the face with myself. <laughs> you don't need to do exactly. that. Exactly. Because that's not actually calm, confident That's not energy. confidence. That's overcompensation. That's not real confidence. So I don't know if any of this is relevant to you, Jillian. I think But it, it might be something to... Well, I don't know what her energy is going into Oh, oh, I thought you meant like... Don't listen to anything we just said. I'm like, no, of course what we just said is accurate. I'm saying I don't know what your energy is like, but it might be something for you to pay attention to if you're feeling like it's your personality turning these people off. There might be more going on. There might be some anxiety or some fear that might be clouding it up. And it might not actually be your personality at all because some people in your life like you or your personality. I'm sure of that. Okay. So is that enough? (laughs) <laughs> I think that was enough workplace interpersonal dynamics. Yes. Right? Yep. Well, that's a really thrilling episode title that will never be. <laughs> no, let's not use that. <laughs> okay, well, we mentioned a lot of past episodes that I will link to in the episode description. So as well there. as an upcoming episode that oh, will yes. be airing later at. this month. Yes, we have a bonus book club, y'all, coming up later this month. So mm-hmm. we're going to be reading a book about energy vampires. Mm-hmm. And I know some of you are dealing with energy oh, vampires. Almost all, because again, the people-pleasing episode of our podcast is the most popular episode ever. And people-pleasers are the most tasty prey of energy vampires. Oh, yeah. I've experienced that Yeah, many times over. Yeah, I mean, I... Ooh, we're You're like garlic. That. I'm the human form of garlic, and I do love garlic. <laughs> so it was a match Literal made in heaven. And figurative garlic. <laughs> okay, that was a nice compliment. I just love people thinking of me as the human form of garlic now. <laughs> you know what? An acquired taste, a strong, people polarizing love thing. Sure. Yeah. I mean, right? There you go. I think it's accurate. Take that, Jillian. <laughs> um, okay, so we will, that's it. I think that we're done. (laughs) So we'll see you again. Well, you'll hear us again on Tuesday with a new blog from me. I think so. Okay. 
And feel free to leave us comments on this episode if you relate to any of these people or if you are these people and you want to share <laughs> share how this resonates. We would love to hear from you. Okay, see you Tuesday. See you then.